Over to you, Tapa. All right, finally, our last talk of the day is by Professor Saravich, and she will be talking us talking to us about uh, their experience. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for all of these amazing talks today um, and this series. So I thought I'd start um, by introducing myself to this crowd, because um, I know not everyone knows me. So I'm very interested in this phase transition that happens in membranes. Um, it's a miscibility transition. and um, uh, my group at Michigan is very interested in understanding how this phase transition contributes to cellular processes, especially those that happen at the plasma membrane. Um, and so our lab uses mostly kind of single molecule super resolution imaging methods to kind of try and answer some of these questions. Um, but the talk today is about how I got here. Um, and so I thought I would start early. Um, I'm, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, to these two people. Um, my parents uh, aren't native East Coast academics. Um, they both grew up in rural Illinois um, in between Chicago and Champaign, Urbana. Urbana. Um, my mom grew up on a farm um, and my dad uh, in a farming family. And then my dad grew up also on a farm, but but um, his his mother who raised raised him and his brothers were uh, was a school teacher. Um, so they, they um, went to high school together and then moved, uh, both went to college at the University of Illinois. My mom in chemistry with dreams of being a doctor, which was very radical at the time. Um, and my dad, I think in physics. So my father in particular was, was an interesting character. He, um, after uh, they finished undergrad, they both moved to the Boston area, my dad for grad school at Harvard, um, where he was in biochemistry. And he worked on this exciting, at the time, um, um, antimicrobial peptide called gramicidin. Um, and, and his thesis was all about determining the structure of gramicidin in solution. Um, after, his, uh, after his defense, he moved to Yale, where he was a postdoc um, with Stryer of biochemistry um, uh, uh, textbook fame. Um, and I was born right in the middle of these two papers. So he's still fascinated with, with gramicidin. Uh, and then not too long after that, so his early work had been in solvent, then this fluorescent work in, in, um, in bilayers. And then he, he went back and actually did this structure of gramicidin in bilayers. And this, is, this was really important because it was one of the, it's the first ion channel basically that, that people understood how it worked. Um, and this was right as people were understanding what bilayers were, uh, which I think is pretty remarkable. Okay, so my mom was a doctor um, and she was training to be a, a medical doctor. And in, in the process of this training, she, she figured out that um, my, my father's father who died when he had been very young, um, she, she guessed that he'd probably died of this disease called Huntington's disease, which is a, is a family uh, disease, neurodegenerative, uh, tends to be uh, onset is in kind of the thirties and forties. Um, and, it's, and it's dominant and it passes through families. Um, and, and she figured this out and not too long after she figured this out, uh, my, my father's older brother um, was diagnosed. And not too long after that, my father was diagnosed. Um, and so he was an assistant professor at Harvard at the time um, when he died um, and, uh, and left all of this research yet to be done. Um, and so this was when I was uh, just before my sixth birthday to give some context. So I, I remember him, I remember going to the lab, but I don't remember a lot of the details about his life, um, but I've got to learn it over time, which is fun. Okay, so here I am. Um, I'm uh, growing up with a single mom um, in, in Brookline, Massachusetts. So my parents had a little of advanced uh, warning of, of this impending tragedy. And so they got us set up in a good school district in a place where my mom could, could handle us as much as possible, as much as you can imagine um, that being able to do that. Um, and she did an excellent job raising us. Um, and I went through lots of awkward periods and I'm sharing these embarrassing pictures with you now. But um, mostly I just wanted to say I was, you know, classic, I think, nerdy, socially awkward. I had a very confusing gender presentation. At, at that time I was considered a tomboy. I think if, if I were growing up now, I would have kind of identified as, as non-binary. Um, but that word didn't exist then. Uh, so I had no idea. Um, like many people, I think in this crowd, I had an inspiring teacher. Um, mine was my, my senior math teacher in high school. He pushed me harder than anyone ever has or had up until that point. And, and doing so gave me the confidence that I could actually succeed kind of figuring things out on my own, which I, I certainly didn't have at that point. 
Um, also, I had this amazing friend um, who believed in me and who did all these physics nerdy things with me, um, like taking classes at Harvard over the summer um, and um, talking about the Feynman lectures uh, in our spare time. Uh, so he was a big part of my growing up too. And, and uh, I applied to Harvard because that was my dream at that point and I got rejected and I was devastated. He got into Harvard, of course, and went, um, but uh, he, he, he believed in me. I went to MIT, so it's not so bad. Um, and uh, anyways, gave me this kind of when we graduated, which was, a, which was a big thing for me and kind of ridiculous now at the time because I just became a professor officially and uh, it's weird to see this again. <laughs> anyway, so I went to MIT. I, I was uh, kind of, I think a little bit framed by knowing, uh, let me say one thing. So my dad um, didn't know that, that this terrible disease was in his family, but, but I did. Um, I grew up kind of with the benefit of knowing, but also the burden of knowing. And I think that shaped a lot of my path. Um, and so one thing is when I went to college, I was in a rush. I knew I wanted to do physics um, for some reason. I don't, I don't know exactly why. Um, and I was pretty good at it. And I wanted to get it all done as fast as I possibly could. Um, and in the process, I met this guy, Peter, uh, who was in kind of my advanced second semester physics class, the first semester kind of I guess in a rush too, to some extent. And we became really good friends and he, he really helped me through um, MIT, which isn't really known for lifting people up um, at this stage. And I, and I certainly didn't get lifted up too much, um, but he really helped me along. Um, the other really influential thing at MIT was that I got to work for Ray Weiss. Um, so he's known now certainly for his Nobel prize in physics for LIGO, um, but I worked in his lab long before that. Um, and he had this lab filled with, with, um, with tools and filled with, kind of materials to build instruments. And he let me go off and build an instrument um, to, to measure something. And I had never had anything close to this opportunity before. And it, and it helped me fall in love with experimental science. Certainly why I'm doing what I'm doing now is, is because I had that lab experience. Um, and I actually, when he got the Nobel prize, I looked him up and he's, he's uh, on his Wikipedia page, I, I've got a mention, which is pretty cool. So thank you. That's how I figured out I have my own Wikipedia page. Um, right, I also came out in college and I was involved in this organization called Gamut. I even ran it. Um, I was uh, not very good at it. I'm not a very political person, but this is, this is kind of was my way to try to figure out how to deal with my queerness at the time. And, and it was very awkward. Um, what really helped me was I, I started playing rugby also at the end of uh, MIT. Um, and this was a great community for me. Um, it was a place where I could be queer, I could have my complicated gender, and it didn't matter. There was a bunch of other people that ha also had complicated things going on with them. Um, and, uh, and we all got along and we were all there for the reason of playing this awesome sport. Um, and so that's carried with me throughout my career up until recently. Actually, I've, I'm not doing it anymore, but it followed me through grad school, through my postdoc, um, and I moved from player to coach. And it was a real huge influence on my life. I spent a year um, between college and graduate school in Portland where I was an electrical engineer. Um, and this is where I knew I wanted to be a scientist because I uh, liked the learning of the project that I was working on, but not the actual doing of it. Like I wanted to do the next thing instead of just executing what I had learned. And, and that was a good sign that I needed to focus. I needed a career where, where learning was the point. Um, so I went uh, with that kind of mindset into the University of Washington where my first year I got to meet uh, this brand new assistant professor who hadn't even started yet um, and uh, saw her give a kind of recruiting talk and, and, and decided that this is what I was gonna do. Um, so at the time she'd been working on um, lipid monolayer systems um, and I found one of her papers that she, I think this is the one she talked about at that recruiting thing. Um, and I just thought it was great. She had a lot of energy. Um, her science was super cool and I, I was signed on right away. Um, the other big influence in the beginning was this guy, Luis Begatoli. I saw him present at the Biophysical Society um, about his amazing giant unilumellar vesicle system where he saw phase separation. Um, and I went back to the lab and we, re we did reproduce the experiment pretty quickly and I got the results the first day and it was kind of, then we were off to the races, um, which was really amazing. He recently died, which is really, a, really very tragically, but uh, he had a huge influence. So at, at uh, University of Washington, I really came into myself scientifically, personally, I became comfortable in my skin. Um, I got confidence that my science was good and I could keep going. Um, and it was a really amazing uh, time for me. Um, and, and also a, a rather productive one. 
Um, one exciting thing or interesting thing that happened is after I published my first paper with Sarah Keller, which was this one, I, you know, do what you do. I, I PubMedded myself because I was so excited to see my name in print. Um, and I found this. So I was on the top, which is what I wanted to be. But then towards the bottom here was another beach. And I recognized this immediately as my dad. Um, and I looked up the paper and and this was the kind of the beginning of realizing that my science, that I shared more than genetics with this person that I died when I was five years old, um, that we actually shared so much in terms of science, um, which is really crazy. Um, and I don't understand, but, I, but it's been a really great blessing for my life. Um, and I think one of the things that's been amazing about it is that like I've met, he had a community of scientists uh, that are now my community of scientists. And, and I've had this like uh, cheering section kind of in the back. Um, watching me progress through my career and, and rooting for me every once in a while, you know, sending me a letter or, or giving me a high five, um, but always protecting my secrets. Um, and uh, anyways, so it's been really a wonderful thing to get to know him through his colleagues. So um, at UW, we were quite successful, uh, published many papers. Some of these were with Klaus Garwish, who was one of my major mentors too during this time. Um, and in this, we really kind of, I feel like I came to understand what was going on in model membranes, in simple membrane systems. We could understand it very deeply. Um, so in my postdoc, I knew I wanted to bring this to the next level. I needed to learn some biology. Um, but I really struggled with this transition, both because I needed to find the right lab to do this in, but, but also because I was, I was trying to feel like, I was feeling like I had to decide if I wanted to push preserve my personal life or if I wanted to preserve my scientific life. Um, because at this point I was getting close to the age where my father was when he, when he had was diagnosed. And I, I, I wanted to be comfortable that I was making the right choice about what was the most important thing to me, um, which was a lot, it made this hard. Um, so what I did is I actually chose personal. I stayed close to uh, uh, Washington because um, I had a relationship that I felt like I needed to preserve at the time. Um, and, and the way I could do it was by staying close. Um, and I worked with Bob Hancock, who's a microbiologist kind of at UBC. Um, and the lab uh, tried hard, but I, I was really a terrible fit for me because I was a physicist. They didn't know what to do with me. Um, at the same time, I got to meet Jennifer Thewalt and Martin Zuckerman at, at SFU. And we did some science that was very similar to the science that I had been doing in Washington at, at UW. Um, but but different enough that we published some more papers. But it wasn't the step that I wanted towards in learning more biology. Um, another big break during this time was that I got invited to give this talk at a Keystone Symposium um, in front of a lot of biologists. Um, Sarah Keller had been invited, um, but she was very pregnant at the time, and so I got the I got the second call. And it was it was important, I think, for me to meet this larger community. Um, and anyways, I, it was important. So at that meeting, actually, not too long after it, I realized I needed a change. And so I moved to Cornell and worked with this amazing team, Barbara Baird and David Holokwa. Um, and, and their lab was perfect for my postdoc. They cared about the physics, which is, was my background. They knew the immunology. They were patient with me in learning. Um, and we could do all sorts of great things, I think. So there's I get to be by the microscope again, which is great. Um, also there, I got to uh, meet many people at Cornell, which is a really wonderful place. And one of them was Ben Whittem. And at the time, I was getting excited about critical phenomena. Um, and Ben was really there to hold my hand as I made lots of mistakes. Um, I also got to meet Jim Sethna um, and his, his student, Ben Makta. Um, and Ben, in particular, has stayed my collaborator to this day. It's been an incredibly valuable connection that I made there. Um, so at, at Cornell, I noticed there were critical fluctuations in vesicles isolated from plasma membranes of cells. Um, and this kind of uh, observation kind of has spurred all the directions that I'm going in now. Um, not all of them are directly related, but it certainly motivated it. So we do, we do modeling. Um, we did the early work there was looking using uh, electron microscopy to look at protein distributions in cells. Um, and then the, uh, the storm palm revolution hit and I saw one of the early talks and I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and so then I worked um, to do single molecules, super resolution imaging, um, largely uh, kind of with uh, this grad student who had just joined um, Barbara Baird's lab basically, um, Sarah Shelby, uh, who, and we got to learn this together, which was really amazing. Um, the other thing that happened when I moved to Cornell is that I entered into a new relationship um, with my, my now wife, um, Aaron. Um, and this was also a very big moment for me. Um, didn't take us too long to get married. 
Um, and since then we've kind of raised this, or we're starting to raise this amazing family. Um, and through this relationship, I've realized a lot of the things that I never even occurred to me were possible when I was growing up. Cause I was, I had this idea that I was never gonna be a parent. Cause my, my dad wasn't a parent and uh, look at me now. So at Michigan, there's lots of science. I'm not gonna talk about any of it, but I, I appreciate all these people. I just gave my full, um, my, my promotion talk to become a full professor. And so I got to acknowledge them all. And this is kind of just a summary of all the amazing things they've done. Okay, so bringing it back, um, my father worked on Grandma Sidon and he even has papers about how lipids influence the function of this thing, which is just crazy because this is what I'm interested in. And in fact, I have a couple papers and a grant kind of related to this topic right now. And it, I don't think it has any direct correction, but it's amazing to have circled back so close. And so I don't know, maybe I need to see his grant proposal so I can predict what the next thing I'm gonna do. Uh, but every time I look back at his stuff, I'm always kind of shocked and amazed and I see new things where there's amazing overlap. Um, so I will leave you with this. This is my family this last year. And there's a little bit of fabulousness. One of my, um, one, one of my kids dancing at Pride. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. That was awesome. So we're <laughs> handing it over to Sri for questions. And Sri, please take it over. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Again, on behalf of the audience, there are many, many thank yous from the audience. Um, I'm jumping straight into a question from Shubham Tripathi, Shubham Tripathi um, on your insights on working in a group where your background doesn't necessarily align with let's say everybody else's for example being a physicist in a bio group and so on i mean i i don't think i did it very well i i think the key for me was finding the people that i could talk to where i could ask the stupid questions um or even just share my ideas which were always kind of crazy compared to i mean just unexpected like other you had to have the right background to understand kind of why my question was even being asked and i needed to find that subset of the world to, to interact with in that environment. And that's what I couldn't find uh, at UBC, or I realized in retrospect, that's what I didn't have. But I definitely had that at Cornell and that was, it was part of how I could actually then learn all this new stuff. Thank you. Um, one from Sagmeet Sinha. Um, I'm paraphrasing um, your insights on making this jump between being in a very productive group to then doing your own thing. Uh, I think this means about it being in, from going to grad school to after that. Um, I think for me, like I think other people have said too, like I've moved towards my interests. And so I actually am, to be honest, most a little bit bored of the stuff that we had done then. I really feel like I at least got to a point in it where I was, I had answered all my questions. And so it hasn't, there's, it hasn't been a big draw to go back, which is I think good because, because I think it would have been very easy to go back. Um, I think that the power of all of this and, and biophysics in general is, is actually explaining the biology. And in order to do that, you have to do the biology. And so, um, so I'm trying to do that as best as I can. Yeah. Thank you so much again for a very inspiring talk and these answers. Um, in the interest of time, I'm closing the recording.